Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are here today because tomorrow all four regions of the Restore Illinois plan are eligible to move forward into the revitalization phase, or phase four of our Restore Illinois plan. With me today are two familiar faces to viewers of our COVID-19 briefings, IDPH Dr. Uh, IDPH Director Dr. Ngazi Azike, who you've seen many times, uh, and the University of Chicago's uh, Executive Medical Director for Infection Prevention and Control, Dr. Emily Landon, whose advice, frankly, I have sought often, and she's been very generous with that advice, and I thank her for that. Also joining me are Carlos Nelson, the Chief Executive Officer of the Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation, who has made a career out of delivering meaningful community and economic development to our residents. The doctors and public health experts have reviewed the data and the proposed conditions for greater public activity and work conditions and have approved them, including the following activities with COVID-related health and safety guidelines. Health and fitness centers will reopen. Indoor dining at restaurants and bars will resume. Movie theaters, museums, and zoos will restore operations, and childcare and schools will reopen and expand, all in accordance with IDPH safety and health guidance. Starting tomorrow, hundreds of thousands more Illinoisans will be able to return to work. Moving to phase four this early was never a given. I've said since the beginning that data and science would design our path forward. And if any single region of the state were trending in the wrong direction in case positivity, hospitalization rates, or hospital capacity, we could not in good conscience offer that region the go-ahead to phase four. We've seen what's happened in other states that have allowed politics or short-term thinking to drive decision-making. Many other states are now seeing significant increases in cases, hospitalizations, and intensive care bed usage, and they're being forced to move backward and stay at home. That's not the story in Illinois. Here, we have been gradually restoring business and leisure activities in a highly deliberate manner, guided by doctor's advice. And Illinoisans are following the mitigations that we can each do ourselves, like wearing face coverings, keeping six feet distance between us, and washing our hands frequently. As a result, we have significantly reduced our positivity rate our hospitalizations and ICU bed use, and we've seen dramatic declines in COVID-19 deaths. This is not to suggest in any way that our battle is over. But so much progress has been made, and if we continue to follow the path the doctors recommend, we can continue our march forward toward more normalcy. It's because of the people of Illinois that we're seeing a trajectory of success where other parts of the country are not. And I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about that trajectory and remind you of where we've come from. Statewide, our COVID-related deaths per day are down 65% from a high six weeks ago. Even as our testing continues to grow, our COVID cases are down 76% from the trend's height seven weeks ago. From a peak in the first week of May, the number of COVID positive hospitalizations, including in the ICU, has dropped by over 60%. And we've seen a 67% decrease in ventilator use since reaching a high in mid-April. As we reopen so many businesses and activities in each phase, it's been important to watch the metrics closely to see if all the added activity would cause a spike in our numbers. That's what we did through phase three. And the positive trends have continued while thousands of our small businesses in every part of the state have opened their doors again safely, as did our state parks, kids' day camps, and kids' summer programs. That's in large part because people have been wearing their face coverings in public and following other advice from doctors and scientists. 
I feel a solemn obligation to emphasize that we expect the journey ahead to be difficult. As more aspects of the economy open and more person-to-person -person interactions take place, there are many more opportunities for the spread of COVID-19. The virus hasn't gone away. And when people aren't wearing face coverings, gatherings in, gathering in large groups, and not practicing physical distancing, they're getting sick. And some are dying. And I mean people of all ages. Senior citizens, those who are in their 40s and 50s and 60s with pre-existing conditions, and yes, even young and perfectly healthy people have lost their lives to this terrible new disease that we still know so little about. That's why I'm not afraid to protect the people of Illinois by moving a region back to an earlier phase if we see a surge. Ours will not be one of the states that takes no action in response to a return to the peak. Until we have a vaccine or effective treatment, our core pillars for safely moving forward remain the same. Widely available testing, extensive contact tracing, and widespread use of face coverings and social mitigations by everyday Illinoisans throughout the state. On testing, today we hit an important new milestone by surpassing 30,000 tests in a single day for the very first time. Continuing to grow our daily testing in this next phase has required a newly aggressive approach, one that makes our state a national leader in flexible testing to meet the demands of a more open economy. We're in the process of launching 12 mobile community testing teams that can be moved anywhere in the state to mitigate and suppress emerging outbreaks, including places like meatpacking plants, nursing homes, or other traceable gatherings. These mobile teams operate in partnership with a network of commercial labs that we've contracted with on a regional basis, allowing the delivery of results on an expedited basis. On contact tracing, we continue to build up our capabilities, including new hires that have increased the ranks of contact tracers already by 20% since June 1st, for a total of 550 active contact tracers so far across the state. 250 additional new tracers have been identified and will join their ranks over the few next few weeks as we continue to scale up our operations, including new technology, to multiply those new tracers' effectiveness. All 97 of Illinois' local health departments are participating and have applied for funding supported uh, in total by $230 million for an increase in contact tracing. That money is on its way out the door with final disbursement coming in the next few weeks. And because it's critical that we reach all our residents through every means possible, next month, community-based organizations will have the opportunity to obtain funding through IDPH to collaborate on contact tracing efforts alongside our public health departments. Of course, most important to our ability to minimize outbreaks is the efforts of everyday people to do their part. And to date, Illinoisans have reduced the rate of spread in their communities extensively. That's why we've seen the trends that we have and that have cautiously moved us through the Restore Illinois plan. As we move forward, it's critical that everyone continues to operate with those same mitigations. That means maintaining six feet of physical distance, washing our hands regularly, and crucially, wearing a face covering when in public places. Illinois required face coverings in public at the same moment that we began to slowly open more things up on May 1st. Since we implemented that one change, we saw all the numbers stabilize and then begin to fall. And in just the last week, we've seen other states like California and Washington following our lead in requiring face coverings. As we enter this new phase, we will be looking to adjust our plan over time as the data and science allows. 
If we see stable numbers over the coming weeks, we can then consider additional modifications to the framework of phase four. The goal here is to move ever closer to a restoration of activities and business that can be done in a safe and healthy fashion. The philosophy that got us here has been a successful one. Prioritizing public health and watching the virus rate of spread, our case numbers and positivity numbers, our hospital capacity. But any pride in our success has to be tempered by grief. Over just a few months, we have lost over 6,800 of our fellow Illinoisans to this virus. Today, we lost 41 more. May their memories be for a blessing. Many of our residents have lost someone that they love, a family member or a friend, to this virus. I know I have. This pandemic has brought real tragic pain to the lives of countless residents. And amidst renewed calls for racial justice, has disproportionately taken black lives and caused disproportionate economic disruption in the black community. As we take our next steps forward, and especially as we begin to safely reopen meaningful swaths of our economy, we have to continue to look out for one another. Our number one priority must be the health and safety of workers, families, and all of our state's residents. Illinoisans have demonstrated their commitment to that priority in countless ways. Let me highlight just one. Today, the Illinois COVID-19 Response Fund released its fourth and largest round of funding so far, nearly $7 million to over 40 nonprofit organizations all across Illinois, bringing its total impact to over $23 million so far that has reached over 800 organizations statewide. This incredible effort is made possible by the more than 3,100 donors willing to give to their neighbors in these trying times, and by the vast network of nonprofits and volunteers who are on the ground serving families and helping them stay on their feet. This pandemic has brought so much hardship to so many, but through it all, the people of Illinois prove themselves to be the kindest and most generous in the nation. Thank you, and now I'd like to turn it over to IDPH Director Dr. Ngazi Azike with today's medical update. Doctor. So, you did it. Illinois is being touted across the country of getting it right. If you weren't originally sure that staying at home and masking and physical distancing and washing your hands helps slow disease transmission, hopefully you're a believer now. We have seen declining fatality totals week after week for five plus weeks along with our declining numbers of admissions to the hospitals. And you did it with those three W's, washing your hands, wearing your face covering, and watching your distance. Should have worn my cheerleading outfit to celebrate and cheer, but now I want to tell you that there still is a reality check behind that. The virus has not been eradicated. The virus persists, and we don't yet have a vaccine or a highly effective treatment that's widely available. So although we are seeing fewer and fewer cases, fewer deaths, people are still being infected and people are still losing their lives. But as the numbers say, since yesterday, we did report 894 people who were newly diagnosed with COVID-19, which brought our statewide total to 139,434 cases. And as the governor reported, that included 41 additional fatalities for a total of 6,810 lives lost from Illinois. As of last night, 1,626 people are in the hospital with COVID-19 illness. Of those, 399 patients are in the ICU and 216 are on ventilators. An important part of the goal is to increase testing capacity throughout the state. To date, well over a million tests have been run. 
with again, as the governor mentioned, 31,686 being reported in the last 24 hours, an important milestone of crossing 30,000. We are trying to get back to our normal lives. We are going to coexist with COVID. There's a deal, uh, a social contract, if you will. Government officials, including public health leaders, we have the responsibility to gather the best available data and the best available science and share that information with everyone. And in turn, the public's part is to follow those recommendations, which will help keep individuals and entire communities safe. To help, make, to help the public make these informed choices, we are launching a special new tool on the IDPH website that shows people if their county is staying on track. Our incredible IDPH team, along with amazing collaboration from our local health departments, have created a map that shows each county in the state and whether it's meeting target indicators or if there's a reason for some caution. Those indicators include the number of new cases over the last week, test positivity, emergency department visits, and hospital admissions for COVID-like illness. As well, we're looking at the number of deaths and the percent of ICU beds available in the area. The percentage of cases that are part of a cluster and the amount of testing that's been done in your county are also taken into consideration. All of these indicators will be on the website, I think they're up now, and the map will easily show you the status of your county and any other county you're interested in. If your county is colored blue, we're on the right track. If your county is colored orange, that's a caution or a warning that something is going on. And our goal is that with that caution, you will think twice about your own personal habits and activities. Maybe you'll think about reconsidering going out in that large group gathering. Maybe you'll reconsider going to an indoor dining experience. Maybe you'll consider appreciating a, a religious gathering online as opposed to in person. These county level risk indicators do not necessarily mean that a county moves back. What it means is that if the numbers don't improve, we could be headed in the wrong direction. But of course, as you have seen, individual actions are so powerful, and so that is your signal to take action. As we open a lot of our state, the motto is to start low and go slow. Yes, we are all excited to open, but we're opening with limited capacity. We want to be able to measure the effects and then increase capacity as the data tells us that, yeah, we're good. We have gone so far along this right path, so I'm imploring everyone to continue with us in a deliberate manner. We've seen individuals contract the virus after attending uh, wedding celebrations, church gatherings. We've also seen hair salons with what turned out to be infected stylists but with everyone masked and covered, no customers were reported to get infected. The power still remains in all of our hands. I know it's summertime and it's a time to travel and to congregate. We want to chillax. We're coming up on an important holiday, our 4th of July, a day traditionally marked by picnics and parades and other patriotic events. Just a word of caution. Large crowds, of course, do increase your risk of exposure to the virus. It's still a risky endeavor. If you say, well, Dr. Ezekiel, you said that we slow transmission and there are fewer and fewer infections. It should be safer now. I would say, yes, you're right. But because the virus is still out there, we still have to remember the things that got us to this good situation so that we can continue to safely coexist with COVID. Maybe we need to get cozy with COVID because it looks like this virus might not be leaving us anytime soon. So let's continue to do the things that will help us mitigate the risk. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, pl please continue to follow the three W's. Wash your hands, wear a face covering, watch your distance. We all know that that means at least six feet between you and the next person. And as part of this social contract, if you have any symptoms of illness, if you have a fever, shortness of breath, 
please don't go out in public. Please don't dine in a public place. Please don't gather with your friends. Let's take care of our fellow Illinoisans. Let's be respectful of each other. Please stay home if you're sick at all. Remember, we can still spread the virus before we even know we're infected. I can't ignore those voicing opposition to face coverings. You are still part of this contract too. I have to talk specifically to you. Your individual actions or even your inactions will still affect everyone in this state. I'm likening the refusal to wear face coverings to uh, a game of Russian roulette as we don't know who's infected, we don't know if we are infected, we're just taking a chance. This game of uh, Ruskaya Rulietka is a game that is very risky. The stakes are high. It's potentially fatal. Let's not gamble with coronavirus. We don't even know the long-term effects of having COVID-19. What might happen to our lungs 5, 10, 20 years from now after being infected? There's nobody that can answer that question right now. So if we can prevent catching this dangerous virus, we should try our best to do so. The thing that has made the difference now and the thing that will continue to make the difference is you and your behavior. So please, let's continue to use our common sense. Let's be safe. Let's use the three W's to protect ourselves and our entire communities. Thank you so much for joining in this important effort. And now a summary in Spanish. Todos ustedes lo hicieron. Estamos siendo aplaudidos en todo el país como el estado que lo hizo de la manera correcta. Y lo ganamos. Si no estaban seguros el orden de quedarse en casa ayudó a atrasar la propagación de esta enfermedad me, imagin me imagino que están convencidos ahora. Hemos visto una disminución en el total de muertes semana tras semana durante las últimas cinco semanas, junto con una disminución en el número de gente en los hospitales. Y lo hicieron por lavando sus manos, poniendo una cubrecara y vigilando su distancia física. El virus no se ha eliminado por completo. El virus persiste en Illinois. Todavía no tenemos una vacuna y no tenemos un tratamiento efectivo ampliamente disponible. Todavía existe la posibilidad de infectarse y luego transmitir el virus a otros. Aunque estamos viendo muchos menos casos y muertes, todavía hay gente que siguen infectados y muriendo. Desde ayer estamos reportando 894 personas recién diagnosticadas con COVID-19 para un total de 139,434 casos. También hay 41 muertes adicionales para un total de 6,810 vidas perdidas. A partir de la noche anterior, se informó que 1,626 personas en Illinois fueron hospitalizadas con COVID-19. De ellos, 399 pacientes estaban en la unidad de cuidados intensivos y 216 pacientes estaban en ventiladores. Estamos trabajando para aumentar la capacidad de prueba en todo el estado. En las últimas 24 horas se reporta 31,000 686 pruebas fueron hechas. Eso es la primera vez que han tenido más de 30,000 pruebas. Amigos, nuestro contrato social sigue. Los oficiales del gobierno, incluyendo los líderes de salud pública, tienen la responsabilidad de juntar los mejores datos y ciencia disponibles y compartir esa información en tus manos. Y la parte del público es seguir esas recomendaciones que nos mantendrán más seguras a nosotros mismos y a nuestras comunidades. Para ayudar al público a tomar decisiones informadas, estamos lanzando una nueva mapa en el sitio web de IDPH que muestra cada condado para ver si está cumpliendo con los objetivos. Esos indicadores incluyen el número de casos nuevos, la positividad de pruebas, las visitas al departamento de emergencias y la gente en el hospital por enfermedades similares a COVID-19. También el número de muertes y el porcentaje de camas disponibles en la unidad de cuidados intensivos en el área. 
el porcentaje de casos que forman parte de un grupo y la can cantidad de pruebas también se tienen en cuenta. Todos esos indicadores estarán en el sitio web, pero el mapa le mostrará fácilmente el estado de su condado. Si su condado está de color azul, están en el camino correcto. Si su condado está de color naranja, eso es una señal de que posiblemente hay más riesgo de infección. Y debe pensar dos veces antes de salir en un grupo de más grande o tal vez esperar para salir a cenar o al cine. Estos nueve sistemas son señales para alerta, alerta a los condados informando que deben tomar medidas. Me consigna es comenzar bajo y ir lento. Hay que abrir despacio, medir los efectos y luego aumentar si los datos dicen que vamos bien. Hemos ido tan lejos por el camino correcto, así que tu ruego que continúes. Es verano, por lo general un tiempo para viajar y juntarnos. Casi llega el 4 de julio, un día tradicion tradicionalmente marcado por desfiles, parilladas y otros eventos patrióticos. Palabras de precaución. Las grandes reuniones siguen siendo un esfuerzo arriesgado. Recuerda que vamos a coexistir con COVID-19 hasta que haya una vacuna contra este, este virus o una medicina efectiva. Por eso tenemos que seguir adelante con mucho cuidado. Por favor, siguen lavando sus manos, poniendo sus, cubrebo sus cubrebocas y cuida tu distancia cuando estás afuera. Muchísimas gracias. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Emily Landon, a hospital epidemiologist. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Governor and team, for inviting me to be here with you today. The first time I spoke from this podium, it was to ask the people of Illinois to make huge sacrifices in order to protect our neighbors and families. Since then, all of us have canceled plans and watched opportunities, traditions, and celebrations just slip away. We've lost a lot of precious time with our families and our friends. Many have lost livelihoods, and many have lost much-needed income. And 6,982 people in Illinois have lost their lives to COVID since I last stood here. But that number would have been thousands and thousands higher if we hadn't been willing and able to join together and stay home to stay safe. Today, we cautiously celebrate our progress and our success by taking more steps out into the new normal coexisting with COVID. It still spreads like a ghost between people who seem to be healthy before making its presence known. Then it targets the vulnerable, the elderly. And make no mistake, the risk may be lower for some, but too many young and healthy people have succumbed to COVID-19. And there will be more deaths to come. Staying home was an important tool to fight a raging firestorm of infection and there will still be embers and even brush fires that could force us to pull back to an earlier phase or turn a county orange on the new website. But what we must avoid is a conflagration that sends us back to our homes and threatens our health care system and our economy. We have to learn to extinguish these small sparks by starving them of the fuel that they need in order to spread. We do this by wearing masks by keeping our distance, washing our hands, staying home when we're sick, getting tested when we need to be, and engaging with and following the advice of the contact tracers when they call. None of these interventions is perfect or meant to be perfect on their own. And some are impractical in certain circumstances, but layered together, they knit together to make a safety net that lets us go and get our hair cut or have a meal with friends, and hug our families. I want to say a few more words about masks because I'm really worried as I understand that many people have come to see wearing a mask as some sort of political symbol. But 
unless the mask literally has a political statement written on it, I guess, it's not political. It's a piece of fabric that covers a part of your body that needs to be protected, like gloves in the winter or my dress. Maybe it's uncomfortable or too hot or itchy at first. But I remember my first days as a medical student having to wear masks for long periods of time and being uncomfortable. But over time, I learned to get used to them, just like you learn to get used to wearing pants every day. And I think that you'll get used to wearing a mask too, if you give it a chance. Because the only message I see when someone wears a mask is that you care about your health and mine. That you're not willing to take a chance or gamble with this virus. It's essential that we wear these masks in our public buildings and in our public places. But it may also seem unfair that these places also have limited capacity now and will do for such a long time. But this is really just a recalibration of our own personal sense of what it means to be too crowded. I mean, we've all planned to do something and then arrived at the activity and realized it was way too crowded and walked away. So now that you're thinking about that time, take that crowd size and cut it in half and then cut that in half again that is what the new normal looks like. It means we have to be patient and wait our turn to do some of our favorite things. And if we do that well, we take our turns, we wear our masks, we keep our distance, we'll be okay. If we don't, we'll see those little embers grow into the blazes that are raging in other parts of our country. Here in Illinois, we know that COVID is no hoax. And we are determined, and we have shown how determined we are to do whatever is necessary, even if it means months of patience, hand sanitizer, and masks. So please, answer the phone when the contact tracers call. Wait your turn with grace and patience and respectfully give people the distance they need. Clean your hands and never ever leave your house without one of these. It's up to us, and we can save both lives and livelihoods if we do it right. Thanks. I'd like to turn the podium over to Carlos Nelson. Thank you. Thank you for the invite to speak. Um, you know, <clears throat> Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation, that's the community development corp that I, that I work for, that I've worked with for 20 years. And, and in those 20 years, we've, we've done comprehensive community development work. We've done education and youth development, economic development, housing and senior services, health and wellness, and community engagement. But because of COVID-19, my organization has, put, uh, has fully pivoted as Auburn Gresham became ground zero for COVID-19 cases and deaths in April. In fact, you probably are aware that the very first death in the city of Chicago happened in Auburn Gresham, Ms. Friesen, just a mere three blocks from my office. And then tragically, she lost her younger sister to COVID-19. GAGDC's uh, role as a command center for COVID-19 crisis response in Auburn Gresham and the suite of crisis response activities to save and sustain lives is really about the fact that our community is at risk due to a number of historic social determinants of health. We've begun providing emergency rental assistance, mortgage assistance, utility assistance and grants to small businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19. We've begun doing food distribution and delivery to seniors and other vulnerable populations in the community. We do outbound calls and wellness checks, street activations, passing out PPE. In fact, masks just like I have in my hand. And right now at 79th and Racine, Anthony Friesen, and my staff from GAGDC are passing out free masks to residents as they pass. 
working with Blue Cross Blue Shield. You see, Anthony Friesen is the embodiment of what my message is here today. He lost two sisters to COVID-19. Now, I'm not an expert. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not even in the field of medicine. I am just a community guy who loves my community. My message is to the black and brown community communities right now. It is critical in our black and brown communities that community leaders lead by example. I implore every father, every brother, every church member, every business owner to take this next phase seriously. Regardless of age, regardless of profession or hobby, we must do our part to maintain a level of awareness that the coronavirus is still real with no vaccine. Wearing a mask, watching social distancing, washing our hands regularly, or just being mindful of safety protocols, these are just a very small price to pay. So as we learned in our humanities, humanities classes way back when, with freedom comes responsibility and the freedom to move around and enjoy many of the normal as aspects of life also require us to be responsible. So let's be responsible men. Let's be responsible family members. Let's be responsible friends. Let's be responsible citizens. Our children, our families, our schools, our communities are counting on us to keep them safe. I would now like to ask our governor, Governor Pritzker, back to the podium to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions from members of the media. Um, Governor, you mentioned during this that you lost a family friend or a relative or someone close to you. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, someone that I've known for more than uh, 25 years was a leader in um, our community when I, I used to live in Evanston. Uh, and he was a real leader in Evanston, somebody who cared deeply about young people, in particular those who had gotten in trouble and he wanted to help them reform their lives as he had himself. A um, man named Hecky Powell. Um, and I just, you know, I, I grieve for his family and I, when I found out that um, his life had been lost, I honestly, um, I had to call people that we all, that, that I know that are friends with him too and share the grief that I've had um, over that loss. And, you know, I know many others who are uh, suffering, have suffered over the time of COVID-19 with the virus, including our attorney general uh, that we all know is um, recovering at home. And um, so I hope we'll all pray for him and for everybody who's suffering now. Um, you mentioned that you would not be afraid to take a, st a step back. Should we have to? Could that mm -hmm. include a stay-at-home order? I know California's talking about that as a possibility. Look, everything that we've gone through over the last three and a half months um, has led us to this point where things are going well and in the right direction. And it allows us to gradually open our economy and to do more, have more activity and so on. Um, but I'm not afraid to move us backward to the things that we've done in the past. I, you know, you can, each one of these phases has aspects of it that we may need to return to. Um, I'll just give one example. You just heard uh, that in um, uh, Texas that they've issued an order to uh, eliminate elective surgeries in Texas because they no longer have enough hospital beds. We allowed elective surgeries uh, more than a month ago um, back in uh, early May. And uh, if we had a trouble with hospital beds, uh, with uh, ICU beds, that might be something that we would need to do. That's one example. 
Um, so in the country, we've seen some spikes in cases among young people. Are we seeing any of that in our new cases that have been reported in the past couple of weeks? Um, I, I would say that we've seen numbers of young people contract uh, COVID-19. And indeed, very recently, there was an accounting of uh, the, the cases in, uh, in Cass County. And I looked at the specific numbers by age bracket, and there are quite a number of people in their 20s who had contracted COVID-19. And so I immediately called Dr. Azike after I read this article and saw this um, uh, graph. And, um, and she explained that, that much of that had to do with an outbreak at a meat processing plant uh, in that area. But that can happen anywhere. I mean, it isn't just meat processing. It can happen in any office environment, in any manufacturing environment. It could happen anywhere. And you know, in many of the places people work, there are young people working there. Um, so it, it's a challenge that we are paying very close attention to. I know everybody focuses on seniors because it's had such a devastating effect on people who are over 80, over 70, and so on. Um, but we can't forget that many people who are younger than that contract um, and sometimes die from COVID-19. Um, with some of the executive orders you're going to be um, filing tomorrow, will that also include a moratorium on the evictions? Will that be extended? We're continuing uh, the course that we've been on. There are people that are uh, that are very, very challenged in these moments from uh, with uh, uh, you know paying their rent uh, as we're recovering the economy. Um, you know we don't we want to make sure people are not thrown out of their homes becoming homeless for something that is you know, uh, that everybody is suffering from. Um, and we're trying to balance the interests of, uh, of the people who own those properties with the people who rent from those properties uh, by giving rent assistance, for example, and quite a lot of rent assistance we just recently allocated um, through our COVID-19 relief funds. Uh, and those will, in fact, um, Carlos was mentioning, you know, those are, are gonna be distributed through many organizations throughout the state. Uh, this is from Amanda Vinicky from WTTW. Um, what's your reaction to the lawsuit filed by landlords that seek to halt your ban on residential evictions on grounds including that another executive order doing so exceeds your authority? I just respond with the answer I just gave. It's important for us to stand up for people who are working class, people who cannot otherwise afford to maintain their home. We do not want people to become homeless uh, in this difficult crisis. Would you be open to carving out exceptions versus a blanket ban? For example, a ban only on evictions related to renters who cannot pay directly due to COVID-19. Look, I mean, we could have lots of conversation about different ways in which to preserve people's homes, to preserve the shelter that they live in uh, now. And I'm obviously open to conversations like that. I always have been. Um, and all the way along, I've been you know, having conversations, uh, even with people on the other side of the aisle who deny that those conversations take place. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm somebody who's always looking for a better way to do things. So I, I would listen to ideas. But I, you know, suffice to say that my number one focus here is we've got to protect the people who are most vulnerable to this virus and most vulnerable to the financial impact of this virus. Um, this is from Jamie Monks from the Tribune. Um, you've said if Illinois sees a backslide in coronavirus data moving backwards through phases is a possibility, but what specific benchmarks will you use to determine whether that's necessary? Mm -hmm. And does seeing the spiking case and hospitalization numbers in other states that reopen earlier give you pause about Illinois moving into phase four now? Well, let me start with the latter part of that question, uh, which is, of course, when I look at states uh, that uh, are moving backward and at a, such a rapid pace, um, I always think, you know, are we doing it right? Are we handling this right? Are we measured in our uh, reopening? And I think we are measured in this reopening. We're being careful. Um, so, uh, you know, yes, of course. I mean, there's no, you can't turn on the television and see what's happening in Arizona, Florida, Texas, South Carolina, et cetera, and not, you know, ask questions, uh, are we getting it right? Um, sorry, the first part of the question was just. It was, uh, the, what's the benchmarks that you're looking yeah, for yeah. to determine? So in the Restore good. Illinois plan, you can look online. We actually do say, what, what would be the things that would move you backward? Those are examples. Um, but I told you that, that we can make adjustments along the way. It, you know, if we start to see hospitalizations, you know, go up and, and are unmanageable, we would cut back on elective surgeries. That's one example of a change that we could make. But, uh, but you know, we're, we're taking this as it comes. We're watching very carefully. The metrics that we've been watching all along to move us forward in our phases are the very same metrics that we're watching about whether or not we need to think about moving backward. 
Um, the two federal sites that lost the funding yesterday, how will the state be paying for those to stay open? So we're, we're going to maintain those sites and you know there has been COVID uh, relief dollars provided by the Federal CARES Act um, and so we'll be using some of those dollars uh, to maintain those sites. We, we obviously can't use federal personnel anymore uh, once those sites are, or the, at least the federal government pulls out of those sites so we'll be using you know state contracted um, providers to manage those sites but uh, but but it's very important to us to maintain sites and indeed to grow the number of sites where we're providing testing especially free testing um, this is from Matt Roy from News Channel 20 in Springfield a study came out today saying that food service jobs are down over 40 percent due to the strictness of the reopening plan speaking with restaurants in central Illinois they say it is hard to hire back for a couple of reasons one of them being the minimum wage rising on July 1st has there been any thought of trying to suspend that pay raise to a later date no, um, we are, look, uh, we have a lot of challenges in the state, uh, but uh, one of them is people living in poverty and working at the very low minimum wage that we've had. Um, uh, we are uh, working very hard to uh, help our businesses get restarted, to open up more. Um, you've seen me work at this every day. We've provided relief funds for small businesses across the state, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. But it's not to the detriment of the people who uh, are working class people in our state. It's to the benefit of them. Um, this is from Kelly Bauer from Block Club. Um, is Chicago defying the state's rules by allowing gatherings of up to 100 people outside? Have you talked to Mayor Lightfoot about this? She has not called me about this. Um, I have not. I mean, look, uh, it's very clear. Our state has set guidelines, and every municipality has the um, obligation to follow the guidelines, uh, or they can uh, put in guidelines that are more strict than the ones that we've set out, uh, but not less strict. So I think that's known by the city and uh, understood by really all municipalities across the state. And a second question from Kelly. Amid protests over police brutality and gun violence in Chicago, do you think the city needs police reforms? I know you've talked about police reform efforts, but she's talking about the city specifically. Yes, I mean, I would direct this across the state, but, I, but I, if you're asking specifically about the city of Chicago, of course we need police reforms. I, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, and I have, I have stood... Uh, together with people to protest uh, over that very uh, issue, um, we have you know we have to address police accountability. We have to address uh, criminal justice reform. Something I've been working on since day one of my administration, uh, and that I work very closely with the lieutenant governor on. Uh, and then, of course, we've got to work on investing in our black and brown communities all across the state. And that's something I've been doing since day one as well. Although more recently, we've had, through the Federal CARES Act, we've been able to provide COVID-19 dollars. Uh, to many of those communities because unfortunately um, in addition to the racial injustice that's been experienced for hundreds of years in this country by those communities uh, it's also being experienced specifically by uh, those communities from COVID-19 which happens to uh, attack Latinos Latino communities and uh, black communities uh, to a larger extent than other communities across the state um, I believe while during the press conference, the Illinois Gaming Board said that I think casinos are reopening. Um, can you tell us a bit about that and why you think it's safe for casinos to reopen? Well, I mean, I, what I would say is I'm not an expert about how many times you need to wipe down a video terminal um, to make it safe. That is something that we're, you know, that's one example of some uh, detail that needs to be handled by people who understand the industry well. Um, the gaming board is doing a very good job, I think, of, of taking those uh, things into consideration. Uh, most especially what we want to make sure is that people are safe when they go back to any activity, entertainment or otherwise. Um, but I do, you know, I do would caution that we want to, you know, we are, like other activities, we're trying to do these things in, uh, in measures um, with lots of health and safety guidance. Uh, and that what's the, the number one driving factor is people should not get sick while doing those activities. Okay. Um, this is from Shia from Politico. Five years down the road, what programs or policies will we look at and say they emerged because of the COVID crisis or the George Floyd response? Oh, wow. Uh, uh, this is a philosophical question, I guess. Um, I, look, I, I, those are two, uh, I'm not sure we have enough time to answer that, but uh, here's what I would say to Shia on this. Um, I think COVID is, uh, has affected everyone. 
Uh, and if you think about your everyday life and how it might change, um, there are more people working from home that could be provided that opportunity as a result of COVID-19. Um, and I think that that will be a, have some permanent effect on businesses and on jobs. Um, because I think businesses have discovered that they can do this successfully, and so they may continue to do that. Um, I think with regard, that's one example of something that I think will feel the effects of five years from now. Um, what I can say about the, the murder of George Floyd and the effect that it will have, and let's not forget Breonna Taylor and uh, Ahmaud Arbery and so many others, but the, the protest movement that came out of the George Floyd murder, um, I believe will lead to a permanent change. Um, and it's uh, a permanent effect on policing. It'll be a permanent effect on uh, how we look at investments in communities that have been left out and left behind. Um, I, I, there is real impetus right now, and I'm working with um, the Black Caucus, with the Latino Caucus, uh, and many others to try to develop policies that will have a permanent impact on the way that we make investments across the state and, and making sure that people who, who have been disinvested from um, are able to access the dollars that so many other communities have so readily uh, had available to them. Hi. Hi, Hi how are you? Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, so we were at 2% positivity rate for three days this week. Now we're going back up to 3%. Do we read into that? Do we need to wait a few more days to see if that goes up? I see cases we were dropping significantly. Now we've kind of plateaued. Mm -hmm. Could this be a result of large gatherings, people loosening up, you know, maybe protests? Do we read into this or do we wait? I think you need to wait to really make an evaluation. Here's why. I mean, we don't really look at these on a day-to-day -day basis. I know we report them on a daily basis, but the way we look at them, the way the IDPH looks at it, is really on a seven-day rolling average, on, a, on an ongoing basis. What's directionally? Where are we going? Is it stable? Is it downward? Is it upward? Um, and so, and, and also, sometimes these get reported as whole numbers, 2%. 3%, but actually underneath that it's 2.4% or 2.6%. And if you round those, one of them is two and one of them is three. So um, again, we're watching closely these numbers, but I wouldn't read anything into the current numbers. Um, obviously every day I watch the numbers and I think, you know, are we going the right direction? You know, and I'm rooting for it to go the right direction and we're making policies that we hope will move it in the right direction. So uh, I'm, um, you know, I'm, uh, we're watching, I would wait. Uh, to make a judgment about whether there's some direction here that it's going. But right now I would call it stable. Uh, and uh, that's why we have some confidence. Uh, we've been directionally going down and, you know, if there's been stability for a few days, uh, again, just, you know, watch and wait and we'll make, we'll react to it as it comes. Okay. This question from Sarah Schulte, ABC7, especially allowing gatherings of up to 50 people, bars opening, dining rooms, in dining restaurants, are you prepared for this risk? Here's how we need to prepare as a state. Here's how the people of Illinois need to prepare. The three W's, where is Dr. Azike? Um, you know, wear your mask, wear your face covering, um, watch your distance, um, wash your hands. Th these are real things. I know they sound so simple and yet your mother told you to wash your hands and you know, does everybody do it all the time enough uh, before COVID? No. Uh, but now, these are three things that you can do. They're simple things. You can learn to do them, need to keep doing. Many people have learned to do them. Keep doing them. That is how we maintain, uh, you know, the, the, the trajectory that we've been on even as we reopen. And notice, we're trying to do this in a measured fashion. The states where you see these massive hikes have uh, most often really opened things up completely or done it in a not in a measured fashion and uh, and they're suffering from it. Okay. Uh, this question's for Dr. Landon. <laughs> um, so doctor, just your thoughts on moving to phase four. You know, we do see these other states that are having to go backward. Are we ready for this? What are we doing differently than these other states? Yeah, I think that we're ready. I agree with the governor and with the IDPH. I think that 
we have plenty of testing. We know we're catching a lot of the cases. And that's a big, important deal because that will help us to understand really any gradual or small changes in the numbers. Plus, now is a more forgiving time to move forward. We can be outside more. We can be more distant. And that allows for a little bit of an addition to the safety net, right? And so it's time for us to get, get our wiggles out, as I would say, or you know, get, get our act together and figure out how often we need to be washing our hands and sort of reset our social norms so that we're used to doing things like wearing our masks, washing our hands, and watching our distance, and staying home when we're sick. And so I think now is the time, and I think we have to take advantage of the numbers that look so great for Illinois. Perfect. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, this question from Greg Bishop. Three months in with continued restrictions and COVID-19 awareness, why not trust Illinois residents and businesses to make smart decisions about how they conduct themselves? Indeed we are. Um, we've set parameters and guidance. Um, we've provided uh, people with, uh, you know, with uh, guidelines uh, at the IDPH and DCEO websites um, and told them what the limits are. But we are expecting businesses do have to be responsible during this time period. They do need to encourage people to wear face coverings when they're indoors. Uh, they do need to encourage people to wash their hands and so on. There are lots of things, responsibilities, that businesses as you know, citizens, corporate citizens of the state of Illinois uh, must do, and we're, we're absolutely relying upon them to do that. Um, so, and, and many have been very, very responsible, I might add. There are some scoff laws that, that have just, you know, thrown caution to the wind and uh, unfortunately made it much riskier for people. Um, and, uh, but, you know, but the fact is that uh, you've seen that it would be terrible for business. I think this is the implication of the question um, that, that somehow this is worse for business to, to do it in a measured fashion. But you know what's much worse? Going backward after you've gone forward. That's hard. Um, think about a stay-at-home order that, that, that was put in place. Things then open up and then another stay at home order. If you're a business owner, that's, if you talk about killing a business, that is what will do it. And unfortunately, we're seeing that in some other states. Okay. This uh, question comes from Amy Jacobson. Several nursing home patients were moved to hospitals to be treated for COVID-19. We've been told that many were sent back before the recommended 14-day quarantine. How many infected patients were sent back to nursing homes or long-term care facilities early? Is it in the hundreds? Uh, you know, all of the information about nursing home uh, patients is available at the IDPH website, and I would encourage Amy to go to that website. Is that one of those statistics on there, do you think? Um, well, we've talked about this at numerous press conferences. Um, Dr. Azikas answered the question. I've answered the question. Um, there are, you know, COVID-specific nursing homes that people uh, sometimes go to when they come out of a uh, hospital uh, or, you know, if they still are exhibiting symptoms or something, but they're on recovery. Um, you know, we're trying very hard to make sure that there's separation uh, between people who are COVID positive and people who are COVID negative. And um, again, there's a lot of work that's being done to keep our nursing home residents safe. And, uh, you know, we've answered this question a number of times and she can go to the website to find the other information she may need. Okay. This question from CBS2. On your daily COVID updates, you've typically had uh, Dr. Zike here with the Department of Public Health. At the same time, the state's experiencing massive levels of unemployment and complications with a system that's supposed to help those out of work. Why is acting director uh, with the Illinois Department of Employment Security not available to take questions at these briefings? Well, he's answered a lot of questions uh, to legislators, for example, but, um, but the fact is I've answered many of the questions that have been asked about IDES and certainly ultimately um, the responsibility for our agencies falls to me. I've also talked here about uh, the Department of Human Services and the work that they do and the, uh, and the Department of Children and Family Services and the work that they do. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working very hard. I've made available to everybody the, all the data uh, that we have about the work that we're doing to make it easier for people to apply for and get unemployment. And I think people are, have seen that we've largely succeeded uh, in, uh, in getting unemployment to people who can go online, get that done, and who can, uh, you know, call in. Um, we definitely have a uh, have had a challenge as many many other states have had the systems that were built for this were not built for 
the multiples of unemployment claims that have been filed. And so everybody is, as I've said before, trying to build the plane as we're flying it. Is there any plan to open up employment offices? DMVs have opened up. What about employment offices? Yeah, there's plan. In fact, each of our agencies has a kind of a reopen plan um, that either has been developed or is being developed. And um, it's with the goal in mind of keeping, first, their clients, the people of Illinois, safe. And second, of course, the people who work in those agencies safe. Okay. Uh, my last question comes from Chuck Gowdy with WLS. Today, the Government Accountability Office issued a 400 page scathing report on trillions in federal COVID aid. You once called the nationwide competition for PPE the Wild West. Does today's report vindicate your frequent criticism of administration efforts during the early stages of the pandemic? Well, I don't think it needed vindication, um, honestly. So, uh, I think every state, you know, you've heard so many states talk about their challenges with PPE, and uh, many other states have been as frank as I have about the difficulty uh, that they've had with the federal government not being of any assistance, indeed, uh, kind of hindrance in getting PPE. Uh, we've asked for PPE from the federal government. We, I think we've received 12 percent of the PPE that we asked for, um, and that's been the experience of so many other states as well so um, so I would just say you know that I think the the uh, unfortunately the White House has been utter and complete failure uh, at delivering on what states needed at the most critical time during this pandemic uh, and now you know here we are in June we'd love to get more help uh, with the many challenges that we have you know we get some help and that's great um, but uh, but I think the criticisms I think you know proved themselves out as factual uh, along the way. I don't need today's report to do that, but yes, it's another fact. Follow up to that question. Yes. So this is the last question. Mm -hmm. What does this report forecast as far as preparedness if there's another huge sustained surge of COVID across the country? Yeah, well, you mean what do we expect and how are we preparing? Is that kind of the, the basis of the question? I think it probably is. Yeah, what does um, the report forecast? Yeah, well, so what I can say is that, that uh, we're working very hard to uh, prepare for any potential surge that might take place at any time. People talk about a fall surge, uh, but you know nobody really knows if there's going to be a surge or when. Uh, what we know is we've learned a lot, right? Remember what we didn't know in mid-March. Um, we now have learned quite a lot. So we've been working very hard to build up the stockpiles of PPE that we need. Um, we're making sure that we're helping, assisting, uh, in the ways that we didn't know to help and assist uh, with uh, particularly healthcare institutions and others uh, in and who to protect you know very importantly at the very beginning we did not know the terrible devastation that this would wreak on black and brown communities uh, versus others and now we know and so there's much more testing for example that's available in those communities than ever before uh, and then testing I just want to say um, you know, we really are, have worked very, very hard to get where we are. Get, passing 30,000 was was hard, and um, and uh, but we intend to keep growing the testing. Um, testing, you know, early on you heard me say test, trace, uh, and treat, um, and now I would say test, trace, PPE, and prepare, uh, and that's what we're doing. Oh, yeah, hi. Unfortunately, yes, yes. So Anthony lost two sisters to this, this, this virus. Thank you, everyone.